Walmart's Black and Unlimited platform is making it easier than ever to support Black-owned brands. When you go to walmart.com slash Black and Unlimited, you'll not only get to shop products from Black-owned brands, but also learn about founders like Janelle Stevens of Camille Rose, which specializes in products for naturally curly hair. And there are many more awesome products that you have yet to discover. It's all easy to find with Walmart's Black and Unlimited platform. Join in on celebrating Black brands today and every day at Walmart. We are Black and Unlimited. Visit walmart.com slash Black and Unlimited to discover more. That's walmart.com slash Black and Unlimited. On this week's episode of the Highly Relevant Podcast, Colombian film director and producer Cristina Gallegos on narco film Birds of Passage and filmmaker Antonio Chavez Trejo on how he shot a film on an iPhone. Welcome to episode 104 of the Highly Relevant Podcast, a U.S. Latino show dedicated to pop culture but with a Hispanic twist. I am your host, Jack Rico, and if this is your first time listening, thanks for discovering us. Well, this week I talked to Cristina Gallego. She is the co-director of the new Colombian narco film, Birds of Passage, Pajaros de Verano. We get into why she's reclaiming the way Colombian drug movies are seen in Hollywood, the shame Latin Americans carry with their ethnicity, why she chooses to make highbrow films, and how Latina female directors are making a difference on film. Then, no more excuses. Mexican filmmaker Antonio Chavez Trejo shares with us the secrets of how he shot an award-winning film with just his iPhone and how you can do it too. We begin with Cristina Gallegos. No, ahí sí está ya. Hay que en la muy arijuna acá. No somos hermanos, Rafa. Rafa! That's the trailer for the new Colombian movie, Birds of Passage, which tells the true story of the Bonanza Marimbera, the never-been-told story about the origins of the drug trafficking business in Colombia right before the era of Pablo Escobar. And here to discuss the film is Cristina herself. Cristina, welcome to the Highly Relevant Podcast. Hello. Hello for everybody. So before we get to drugs in Colombia and movies and that sort of representation, um, I want to talk to you why this movie was so important for you and Ciro Guerra, which is your co-director of the film. Why was it so important for you guys to tell this story? For us, it was so important because we were tired of, of the representation about this theme. And we, and we think that it's a, 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 um, a theme that has been represented in a very... Uh, in a in a way that we have not uh, we are not being comfortable with that mm-hmm, mm-hmm. with the glorification and the glamorization of the of all of the narco world no and the and the idea of the violence and the power that that that, that they have in uh, inside so uh, we wanted to to make a film about the tragedy that it means for our culture, for our families, for our societies, for our traditional uh, and rural countries that have been changed uh, for 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 uh, uh, with with the arrival of this savage capitalism in their right. way of with. You're from Bogota. My parents yes. are from Barranquilla. I lived in Barranquilla many times. Soy costeño. Um, and I remember I went to Medellin about maybe five, six years ago, and the conversation about drugs came out, and uh, the people at Medellin that uh, we were with said, please, do not remember any of that. We're trying to move away from that. And even though that you want to be able to tell your side of the way the the, the, the origin of the drug trafficking was created in, in Colombia, this movie is still very violent, uh, mm-hmm. This still, this movie still talks about drugs, and the problem is, is I, I as a Colombian, when I go to a party and there's somebody that's Caucasian, they'll joke with me, and they'll ask me, "Hey, where are you from?" I said, "I'm from Colombia," and he's like, "Ah, cocaine," and he thinks he's being funny, but he's being prejudiced at the same time, right? Yeah. And so I feel that maybe this movie should not have been made because once again, we're creating movies about drugs, whether they're beautiful, artistic, poetic. Was there any resistance from producers, from investors to say, I don't care how, how beautiful the movie is. I don't want to do a movie about drugs and the association in Colombia. Yes, I think, no, we didn't have any problem or censorship like this. 
it was but it was something that was in our in 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 our desire to do this movie also this kind of jokes that people from outside uh, uh, made to, made to you it was made for us and, and for all of us uh, as a colombian but this is something that is very uncomfortable for us and and i don't think that the way to avoid it is uh, to don't talk about because all hmm. the world is talking about no all of this representation has been made since miami vice until now narcos no? and and all the people uh, knows colombian about uh, because these stories but the problem for us is not that these histories exist is that these histories have been told from outside and and never represent have the, re- the representation of, of what it means for us so you're basically and, reclaiming Mm -hmm. this story for yourselves and for our culture yes yes Mm -hmm. and and i think as uh, we are that our societies is our is like is more like our individual stories and 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 i i i want to learn and i love to learn and i and i'm very deep in the world of the psychology to to create the world things a uh, characters and and to think also about about yourself and when you don't want to talk about the things that are more hard for you you are only giving uh, to the to the, the, those things more power because mm. it will be hidden, but we need to process our history and we need to see the history, but not as a victim as or bad pe- bad people. No, right, it's, a, right. it's a when you when you take the responsibility about your history, maybe the things can change. But it's not avoiding the things; it's talking about it, it from your point of view. I also wanted to talk to you about Cido Guerra and this um, the types of movies that you make. Okay. I had a conversation with Ciro Guerra for The Embrace of the Serpent uh, years ago. And the interesting thing about Ciro Guerra is that he makes some of the most beautiful films I have ever seen. I'm not sure if you know a director by the name of Tarsem Singh. He did The Cell. He's done uh, The Fall. And these are visually striking films. But I've always thought that these are also films that are probably too highbrow. They're too intellectually uh, cerebral in terms of the philosophy and the layers and the dimensions of these films, and they don't seem to be movies made for the masses. So I I wanted to ask you, since you work so closely with him, is Ciro Guerra allergic to commercial films? Is he he allergic to lowbrow films? Because I happen to think that lowbrow films do have a value in society. So he hasn't made a commercial film yet, does he ever want to? Because these are types of films that you could wonder if they're going to ever make money because they're not attracting masses. They're attracting a particular aristocratic, highbrow moviegoer. And I think that, that everyone's made the films that uh, it's a uh, approach or, is, or, or that he liked. And I don't think that it's a matter for him or for, or for us about... Uh, don't make so commercial movies, but we also wanted to 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 be loyal to our histories, and uh, and 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 I think that each each film is very different from the other. But you only can do the films that you feel also comfortable with with uh, to talk to to talk about, and uh, and and I think that each each film is very different in the shape and 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 maybe this film Birds of Passage is more wide for the audience than than Embrace, mm-hmm. but Embrace opens the open us the the world to create these these next films and these next steps. And, and I think it's not uh, in his desire to be close to the public. If, if he want, uh, he can. Uh, he uh, and he would love to to go to a bigger audiences. But also, it's something that it's in 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 in. in the, there's many people trying to do commercial films, and and that never works. Hmm. So for us, was more a, a more a thing to find what are the kind of films that we want to talk. And also to to go with the world, I think that the world now is changing 
uh, 10 years ago, most of the people, or 15 years ago, when we started the business, most of the, of the people was trying to uh, copy uh, these commercial firms or uh, commercial structures of general structures and all of this. But we think from the that that we are from a reg- from that region, and we need to uh, be loyal to our histories and, and to the histories that hasn't been told. But also when you when you see the 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 American cinema, for example. Mm-hmm. Nowadays, is something that is not bringing you new things, uh, and 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 what happens, for example, this year in the in the foreign language uh, competition is that most of the people were saying that the more interesting films are uh, from from uh, outside from the foreign language, and and when you see now the, the the this big competition between two kind of films, for example, Black Panther, it's a Marvel film, but it's about black people. Mm-hmm. It's a it's a, a, a lead by women. The women are the, the the smarts in the in the film. This is something that ha- that doesn't happen five years ago, or three years ago. And when you see this competition in front of Roma, the a big artistical film, black and white, indigenous a, a, a protagonist. Mm-hmm. A, but you also know that it, it, this is something that is happening a, with the more commercial. A, 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 Places or in 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 the in the awards, mm-hmm. uh, this is something that the public is also looking for. History is different, and we are we, we think that we are in in that direction. But trying, Christina, trying. wouldn't you mind? Wouldn't you want to do a blockbuster film, a Hollywood film, just to see what the scale is like? I mean, we're talking. You're a producer too. I mean, we're talking about millions and millions of dollars to be able to tell a story. And imagine if you had $200 million to tell a Colombian story. How amazing would that be? I mean, is that something of interest to you as a director and producer in Tucido? Because I've been hearing conversations that you might have uh, been talking to Paramount Pictures uh, Mm -hmm. for something commercial. Yes, I I think that uh, uh, that for us or... For me, I, I can talk for me. Something in, important in all of this process is to have the uh, freedom for the creative input, and and uh, and to have the empathy with the theme, and. And, and at the same time, and, and this empathy is not something that you can build or try because I think that I'm not from a, a yes, I'm, I'm not a, that kind of producer or filmmaker who will gonna do a, anything for money. This is something that is not in my in my goal in life. But isn't I want it, to... but it, isn't what you do a business? Isn't filmmaking apart from art attached to the business? And you as a producer have to come up with the money. <laughs> you have to pay your actors. So uh, so I mean, isn't it a business at the end of the day too? No, it's a it's a it's a business. But if you see a film only as a business, it for me it will gonna uh, That's destroy true. my spirit. I think that the, the the films need also, and and the films that have the, um, that we have made during all of our careers have it has a kind of signature of mm-hmm. a, a, a spirit signature. No, and and this is something that you need to also to. To care and to protect, and and this is a, a for me the most important is to do one film after another and to get money and money. It, 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 this this is a the business itself. I is is not important for me. I I'm came in before studying a cinema. I study business, and at that moment I realized that I don't want to do money for money. I want to do content. I want to. I'm focusing the ideas. I'm focusing the art. I'm focusing the in in other things that that really are the the way how I feel comfortable with myself. It's not a matter of a big business, even if we, I, if I think that we can make it. A little while ago, you mentioned Yalitza Paricio and having indigenous faces in films today. Now, most of your cast uh, is the Wayui tribe from Colombia, uh, which are indigenous. 
Um, w- w- was that a problem for you, selling indigenous faces on film? Because it's been a big hoopla here in the United States and parts of the world. Because, you know, we have Telemundo, Univision, that do not put indigenous faces as leads in their novellas, in their series, in their newscasts. Um, there seems to be a fear for indigenous faces. Is that the same thing in Colombian cinema? Uh, and and why, are, why do you embrace it as opposed to other directors and producers? Yes, I think that we, are, we have fear. Our society has fear for many things. I, I was thinking about the, uh, this reflection that I made you for, uh, about Black Panther and, and Roma. I was thinking those days about uh, that five years ago uh, when the when Kate Blanchett get the the award uh, for Blue Jasmine uh, and she told in the in the Oscar ceremony and, and he invited the the executives to include uh, w- women as lead uh, roles as uh, to do films with female uh, driving uh, characters. Uh, that and, and she was telling that we were not a niche, so uh, and that is something that I think that the cinema it, that usually it, the, the the voices are are male and are white, uh, are high societies. This is something that uh, used I think that used to be until now, but now that the the, the cinema is repeating itself and the people is getting tired of the same of to have the same histories uh, repeating uh, and the and the same films done in a remake way or in a saga way all the things uh, and the and the world is looking for new voices and these new new voices include women include indigenous people include black people include minorities include includes lgtb uh, and all these uh, kind of 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 people that we are and that 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 we are very different in in our humanity but the representation has been done uh, as as we are the same and but now but now i think that is a, it's a moment a more open moment uh, for the for uh, our history and caracol and rcn is the same thing too Yes, it's the same. It's the same that I I, I remember when when we were trained to do the the casting for Embrace of the Serpent, uh, and we were thinking in an indigenous uh, casting. There there was not uh, not more than two or or uh, there's a couple of actors who has uh, indigenous faces, but uh, father and son. Uh, and another one, but there's not too much, really. Uh, Is that a systemic problem, uh, not only a part of Colombia, but, a, a, you know, part of the world? Yes, yes, I think. I think, and, and more there, because we are ashamed to be indigenous, we are ashamed to be black, we are ashamed to be poor people, and 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 the 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 uh, relation with this American dream and with this with the models and with the 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 life that is a kind of uh, this desire or this dream, it's it's uh, insert from outside from this. Uh, for, for example, the, the idea of Jalitia in in Vogue that is something so disruptive also <laughs> right. for the for the um, uh, for all it's it's for all really it's the 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 Mexicans uh, were the the one who say why she could be in a in a magazine like this and this is something that is completely strange. It we is. We are not. Yes, it is. Uh, and then. But, uh, but, just but I think the things ahead. are changing. <laughs> that's, the, that's the good thing. <laughs> yes, that's a good thing. Uh, last couple of questions I wanted to ask you. You're one of the few female directors directing a feature-length film that's going to festivals. Um, is it getting better for female directors there, or is it status quo? Is it not moving? Is it flat? No, the things are, are been changing in the last years. I think that during many years we only have one or two uh, directors that now are 
around 70 or 80 uh, uh, the, the documental directors, uh, female directors, and also in the fiction. But nowadays, with the, in the last, uh, I think, five years, more and more uh, women uh, have been uh, directed things that that has a, a really good success in in documentary and a, first in documentary and in fiction mm -hmm. and now i'm working a, with a, for example with laura mora is a, she released his a, her her previous film in toronto and and a, she get many awards with with his film killing jesus Around the around the world, but uh, but also something that that I uh, that I move and and I also realize is that the press was not supporting her, mm. uh, and we don't know nothing. And it, and and I think since Embrace is the more award a uh, director, but it's female and it's uh, also disappeared from the press. So this is something that uh, uh, when we start to do the press for for the for Birds of Passage, and when, uh, in a, in this year, that it's very important for us, uh, for for the female uh, directors. I also uh, call the press to do the the to put attention to the things that they are uh, they they are talking. No, in a world that is changing now, in a world that is looking for the for the histories of female directors. Um, but I think that in Colombia we already uh, have uh, a, a, a nice group of of female directors, and obviously we are most of the most of the strong producers in Colombia are women, and we are very supportive between us. And, and this is something that is very, very nice and, 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 and give us hope about the changes. Cristina Gallegos is the co-director of Birds of Passage, which is out in selected theaters right now. And before I talk to Antonio Chavez Trejo, here are three Latin extracts you might want to add to your playlist this weekend. ¿Qué tiene si no sé bailar? ¿Qué tiene si no tengo flow? ¿Qué tiene? ¿Qué tiene? Jimena Sariñana. ¿Qué tiene si no sé frenar? ¿Qué tiene si no sé bailar? I'm gonna ride it through it just how you like it tonight. Please me, Cardi B and Bruno Mars. Let's do it one more time. Girl, I ain't one for begging, but now you got me begging. Libre corazón, libre sensación. Amor libre, este man. Yo somos amor libre. There's a new short film making the festival rounds called Resilience, and it is directed by Mexican filmmaker Antonio Chavez Trejo. I don't know what happened. I just opened my eyes and I only felt pain. What makes this short film interesting, though, is that it won the AT&T Film Awards plus $5,000. And listen to this. It was all shot on an iPhone 10. So how did he do it? Where did he get the determination to see it through? What did he learn about himself from filming it? So instead of just asking more and more questions, why not ask the man himself? Welcome to the Highly Relevant Podcast, Antonio. Hi, very nice meeting you. So let's begin with the following question. How did you hear about the contest and what made you want to commit to putting your time to filming this? It was all fault of the actress, Melissa Slikovic. <laughs> she, <clears throat> yeah, we always have to put the fault on someone else. Um, she, she, she approached me, she had this, uh, this idea of this story. And you're like, hey, can, do you want to shoot this with me? And she had a beautiful idea with a beautiful uh, message, uh, really powerful, uh, you know, like in deep theme. And I was like, yeah, if you write it well, I'm up for it. Uh, she gave me like a beautiful script, spent like two weeks just analyzing how the hell are we going to shoot this because we didn't have nothing. So it is like, okay, so it is just going to be you and me, I guess, because we cannot afford anything. And mm. using, my, <clears throat> using my equipment, uh, we just invested, you know, like as much as we could afford between her and I. And... 
that was it. Like halfway through the process, she she actually tells me like, hey, how about if we submit it to this film festival? And then that put us a deadline, which is fantastic for a filmmaker because if you don't, you just keep doing things. And that's the way it went. Like we just had a deadline. Uh, this this was like a super long film to shoot, considering it's a short film because it took us 11 days. But I think that's kind of like the power of it. We actually invested a lot of time and a lot of energy to get everything that we needed to get that production values for it to look as good as it looks. So before we get into how you shot this, I wanted to ask you why you decided to also want to shoot a film about depression and suicide. I have had through my life, uh, I've been in contact, but I have had many friends and people that I care about that have suffered with anxiety, with, with depression. I have seen it many times. Um, I have seen people committing suicide, like not life, but I, I've been in contact with people who actually went through this. And uh, before I thought it was just more like, you know, like a state of mind. I realized that it's way more than that. <clears throat> uh, in this case, the actress and writer, she actually has suffered through this and she has gone through a very important things in her life that actually gave her the lab experience and the need to have this cathartic um, project to actually just put it out. And I thought uh, the uplifting structure of the film itself, of the story, was something that needed to be addressed because usually things just end up being in a more depressive way. And uh, that's what I loved about this script. That's what I loved about this story, that actually it puts you in a, in a, good, <clears throat> in a good mentality on how to actually address this very important topic. I've been to two depressions, one when I was 11 and then another one uh, right before I got out of college and I was looking for a job and I couldn't get a job. I went through a depression. I mean, I think it's natural to go through moments of sadness. The suicide part, that's the one that scares the hell out of me because it's disturbing. So yeah. I think it's starting to become a bit more in vogue to be able to talk about mental health. And I think people like Demi Lovato, uh, Selena Gomez, uh, even Justin Bieber himself, you know, when you yeah. have these young people that are so famous and so suffocated, perhaps, and, uh, you know, by the fame itself, it can be daunting to kind of see a, a natural reality that everyone is okay with. Uh, so I can I definitely get why why you did this. But here's the thing: How did you end up deciding that you wanted to shoot this with an iPhone 10? For two reasons. First one because I didn't have money. <laughs> so the second one is just out of creativity. Uh, so I just, I just, you know you yeah. know what they say: They say that necessity is the mother of all invention. Like a few months before, actually, I started shooting Resilience. I. Uh, I, I got my new phone purposely. Like I, I selected <laughs> your one thousand dollar phone. <laughs> yeah, like my baby. No, but I actually got it thinking about that. It's like, okay, I'm gonna invest in a phone that I can actually uh, use, and it was great because I I could actually uh, go and deduct it for my taxes. Last nice. <laughs> yeah, it's a piece of equipment, right? We knew we had no money to rent like expensive cameras, not to have a crew. Like, okay, I have my stabilizers, I have my lights. <clears throat> Let's do everything ourselves. So it was you and uh, the actress. Pretty much, we just spent like eleven days just getting lost into different trail hikes, going to the desert, going for swims, going into creeks, uh, just getting lost in nature, getting lost in the city, and coming up with all these amazing images that we got. Let's get into the nitty gritty of how you did this. All right. So a couple of questions. You didn't have a budget. Uh, from what you're telling me, it was just you and the actress, which essentially means that the camera crew was just you. You're a one-man wrecking crew, <laughs> essentially, right? Yeah. Uh, which means that you're extremely versatile, my man, to be able to do all that. You know, you got to look at lighting, you got to look at uh, frame rates, everything. So I'm going to start with the following. Did you use any film apps like Filmic Pro or anything? Uh, I have, uh, so I told you, like, uh, for example, I stabilized her, Gimbal, which is the thing that I think Kind of like make the whole thing. Even though I'm really, really stable, I have really uh, good hand to actually just move around. Uh, having a stabilizer is something that if you're going to be shooting low budget, makes a difference. Because if you want to have like nice movement, this compensates for having a Dana dolly or an actual full dolly right. or, a steady, or a steady cam. And our eyes are trained to have this smooth kind of vision in professional things. So this is, this is what technology has come up. Everything com uh, is becoming smaller. Uh, one time we were shooting uh, in LA downtown in a place in a Pershing Square, and <clears throat> I'm shooting with a with a full rig, which is not very impressive, but still it makes it look bulky. Bulky. It is not just like a little phone, 
And then these people from Netherlands come to like, hey, what are you shooting with? Like literally they interrupt us while we were shooting. They were very impressed because everything that was just around the phone. And it's, it is just like, well, there's a little mic and then some cables and a stabilizer. That's it. That's no, crazy. This is getting there. It, it is. Yeah. So you use the gimbal. The one I use is a DJI Osmo gimbal. Did you use that one or did you use a smooth? Uh, what did you use? Yeah, I have a, what's it called? No, I have a Shinju. Oh, okay. Those are, yeah. Let's move forward. Yeah. Did you use different lenses on your phone, like wide lenses for moment? No, there's, there's an app called ProMovie that I love. Uh, I even, sh- I even use it. Uh, if, if I'm going to post something online, for example, like I'm at a concert and I want to just, I don't know. I went to, I went to, uh, to see Smashing Pumpkins, right? Mm-hmm. They were in the forum <clears throat> and everybody was just shooting, you know, on their Instagram or whatever. And then I was, I was just coming out with my ProMovie <laughs> <laughs> Because, yeah, and everybody go like, what the hell? Because, you know, you have all these uh, little gizmos inside so you can uh, adjust all the parameters. And everybody just shooting with their, you know, Snapchat or whatever. And I'm shooting pro movies. <laughs> <laughs> and everybody like, oh, my God, why does it look so good? He's like, well, because I'm a filmmaker. But no, it's just like, you know what? It's just about knowing the tools. Like, right, right, the, right. The more you're into the crafts, you, you know where to get this stuff. Did you use Final Cut Pro or Premiere Pro from Adobe? Premiere. Uh, I love Premiere. Got it. I'm a Final Cut Pro guy. In terms of composition, when you did you do a storyboard for this? Did you kind of lay out a plan of how each shot was going to be? Inspiration from other people? No. I'm kind of like a stubborn in that way. So I, I like to think in words. Uh, not to myself. I like to think towards the story. So I'm, <clears throat> I'm, I'm not someone to think like, oh, I, I like, like just one shot. Or I want to be like really fast paced. For me, it's all about like, what does the story need? And... It took me like a couple of weeks just to sit down before I actually give an answer to Melissa and tell like, okay, yeah, I'm going to shoot this because I want to to know that I, I can plan it ahead. And yeah, every, everything was like locked for literally the second. So we went to get like very, very specific moments. Of course, sometimes you get like fantastic nature things that just happen. Like our ending is just like that. It was just like a gift from nature and God, I guess. <clears throat> but um like we, you, that is the thing about this type of filmmaking. The more you plan, the better quality. The better quality you're gonna get. Yeah, no, absolutely. And you, you could definitely tell me that last shot. I, I was like, okay, how did he get the sun and the like the depth of focus and the forefront of the actress on that cliff without any lighting issues? I was like, what? That shot, Tangle speaking, is just a mistake. Actually, most cinematographers would complain about it because. It is a difficult shot. You don't have no one to actually do it with you. You're just going by yourself. And then the decision was like, okay, let's just, uh, let's just trigger out the focus. Let the, ca- let the camera do whatever it wants, like the lens. I'm going to be doing the operation. I'm going to be behind her. Let just her perform. And then you get that racking that it just comes from that exposure that it just makes everything work. You don't need a major budget. You just need to have the idea. You need to have the know-how, Right. And sure. you have to have the desire to stick it through because you could have quit fifth day in. Were there any challenges at any moment that you said, you know what? Screw this, man. I'm I'm just not going through this anymore. Well, every day. Um, like uh, average, we would walk like maybe 10 to 11 miles just to get to the places. Oh, my God. A lot of these days that we were shooting, they were just like dots. Like we, we got there, we were looking for a waterfall and the waterfall was dry. But then you have to walk the seven miles back. And they're like, okay, you, you want to try to shoot something? You're like, yeah, might as well. Uh, unusable, uh, unusable for this film, some B-roll. Maybe we get it for something else. Um, we had um, the beautiful opportunity to spend like a couple of nights at the ER because um, there was a live accident when we were doing the, um, the water park. It, is, it happens. And Melissa got a uh, concussion. So how did you get through it? Like, why didn't you just quit? What didn't allow you to quit? We had a deadline, so there's not a lot of film festival that are actually sponsored by like a major corporation and has like really good uh, awards and prizes. And I'm like, yeah, like I was there. Actually, me and Melissa were there last year at the AT and T Shape at Warner Brothers, and it was like an amazing experience. And they were like, yeah, I remember these guys. I remember the short films. We want to be there. So essentially, what you're telling me is you did this movie, the short film that won a five thousand dollar award for AT and T Film Awards. For 500 bucks, just the actress that you're going to shoot and a one-man crew with you and your iPhone. And, you know, the know-how and some lenses here and there and a couple of apps. And boom, you did this. 
Yes, that's Dude, exactly how it went. This is insane, man. This is the type of stuff that really inspires me. Because come on, man, let's be honest. How many people don't you know, Antonio, that sit down around just talking shit, right? Just saying, yeah, man, you know, one day we should do a movie and we should do it like this. And nothing ever happens. You leave that room so excited, so psyched to do something. And then everybody drops the ball. No one calls each other back. You're the one that has to constantly go, yo, we're still doing this. Are we still doing this? It is just, I, I, I keep telling people, you're just driven. Uh, I was I was born with that chip of wanting to make. I, I have always been in a, in a certain way a filmmaker. I have, there's recordings of me being like five years old and telling me, telling my aunties like don't shoot against the window. You're gonna get a back. Like you're kidding me. I'm gonna be just a <laughs> you know a blob of darkness. And I was some like six five years old. Like I have always had like that intuitive way of just doing things. A lot about the the, the interviews that I do on this podcast is trying to get. Latinos as a whole, our community as a whole, especially young people, right? That yes. the future is in their hands. You know, if you're like 70, 80 years old, the future is no longer in your hands. So you're now about enjoying <laughs> the future that you built for yourself. <laughs> but in your yeah. 20s and your 30s, you know, you go through you know moments of depression, moments of sadness because you lose sense of where you're headed to, right? And the problem is, is in that middle of that confusion, I always like art and culture because they're things that allow your mind to express themselves from a deep place within you, right? Like in film, like those types of messages, those types of images, they're powerful. A lot of them ask, well, where am I going to get the money? You know, I don't have the equipment. Uh, you know, I can't afford film school. Uh, so I, I, I have good ideas, but I can't do them. And when I hear a story like yours and everything that you did it to do it, I go, dude, stop making excuses. You know, if you really want to do something, you're going to do it. And you're going to get an interview from Jack Rico on the Highly Relevant Podcast about how you <laughs> did that. Because yeah. simply, when you put content out there, you impact people, Antonio. Uh, no, I absolutely agree. And uh, I have been on the other side. when I have been in a festival and then I, I see like an amazing film. And then uh, you, see, you hear the story of like how they do it. And you're like, yeah, what am I seeing? What am I seeing right now? What am I not doing something? Uh, sometimes you just go through like dry, uh, you know, like stages in your life when you're not pulling content. But luckily for me, like there's always people coming to inspire me or and push me like, yeah, do you want to do something with me? Like, okay, well, what do you have in mind? Sometimes I have something in my mind. Sometimes it requires, uh, you, you need as an artist, you need to just surround yourself with people that are as passionate as you to actually keep doing. Because sometimes you don't have the energy, you don't have the, uh, you know, that spark. And it just comes from someone else. And my last question to you, Antonio, is I know you're a professor as well. Uh, you like to teach and you like to impart wisdom. What kind of wisdom can you impart on people that are listening to this podcast right now that have a, an idea in their head? They want to do a magazine. They want to do a blog. They want to become a personal brand on Instagram and then an influencer. Uh, they want to make a movie. They want to act in a, in a TV show. Um, but there's something that's impeding them from getting there. What wisdom do you have to inspire them to get to that next place? Um, <clears throat> let's be bullshit free. <laughs> yes. That is, that is, that is one of the biggest pieces of wisdom. Um, I, I, have, I, I have one person where uh, we have this thing all the time and then we just call it like that. Like, okay, let's, let's just call it bullshit free. Like, you know, like you're bullshitting yourself. And like, yes, I am. And it's all about just like goals. It's about <clears throat> uh, setting your mind into like, okay, what is what is the next step? Um, right now, for example, I have like ton of excuses that I could that I could tell you like of what why like bigger projects are not there. But the the only reason that I can tell you is like I haven't I have not tried enough. When you get to the moment when you're like literally absolutely bullshit free, then you start actually making things happen. All right, Antonio. Thank you so much, man. I appreciate your time. Uh, and thanks for coming on the podcast and talking about your film. Thank you, Jack. Thank you for your time. And that's it for episode 104 of the Highly Relevant Podcast. I want to thank Cristina Gallegos and Antonio Chavez Trejo for joining me. And I hope you guys enjoyed the conversations as well. If you'd like to support the show, please spread the word on social media and tell all your friends about it. You can reach me on Twitter at Jack Rico Official and on Instagram at Jack Rico. Also, remember to tune in this Saturday morning for my two shows back to back. The 
Taller del Consumidor en Telemundo en Consumer 101 on NBC. I'm Jack Rico. See you next week on another episode of Highly Relevant. Walmart's Black and Unlimited platform is making it easier than ever to support Black-owned brands. When you go to walmart.com slash Black and Unlimited, you'll not only get to shop products from Black-owned brands, but also learn about founders like Janelle Stevens of Camille Rose, which specializes in products for naturally curly hair. And there are many more awesome products that you have yet to discover. It's all easy to find with Walmart's Black and Unlimited platform. Join in on celebrating Black brands today and every day at Walmart. We are Black and Unlimited. Visit walmart.com slash Black and Unlimited to discover more. That's walmart.com slash Black and Unlimited.